Hey guys, it's Anne. Welcome to my home worm farming channel. If you're looking for a friendly, helpful vermicomposting community, you are in the right place. Today, we are going to look in on my 55 gallon barrel bin blue. We're gonna do a big harvest and give blue a boost of food and bedding to help the population for the spring. Uh, worm composting in blue is really not like any of the other smaller bins. You deal with things on a much bigger level, which is kind of why I call this bin my hardcore worm bin. Basically, normal small bin rules don't apply and aren't always helpful for you. So when you have a bin this big, you have some interesting problems that you have to solve, and I'm just going to show you what I do. But today what we're going to do, we're going to do the same thing that we did on the European night crawlers last week. And we're just going to do a big, huge harvest. Each one of these buckets is one gallon US. So count how many of them I'm pulling out of here. That's two. And we're not gonna sift right now, simply because I'm trying to get everything together to the right moisture and sometimes this really dry stuff like I'm getting on top actually helps pull the moisture out of maybe wetter castings I'm gonna find down deeper so if you mix them all together then you're getting the dry ones kind of damp again and then you're also trying out the, the ones on top that have been sitting there unfortunately for a really long time but as I said before I'm in full seed starting mode. Uh, my onions have been started in January. Started my hot peppers at the end of January. And I've started doing some of the brassicas and I have to get a little bit more into that now. So I'm gonna need as many of these worm castings as I can get. So stuff at the very end here is the most finished but because I'm using this for a place to put all of my overwintering peppers it's not drying out quite as much as I'd like it to because I've got those uh, seed starting trays on top here for kind of a table so I'm trying to get at least a quarter of blue harvested today that's the goal and then those will sit in a mortar tray to dry out for the next week or two. What I do is I come down here every couple of days and kind of stir them up. That way the ones that are on top that get really dry can get put in with the ones at the bottom that are kind of a little bit too wet to sift. And as you can see, I'm not finding any worms in this end of the bin. So you know when they've moved out that they're done with it. All right, that is actually one whole mortar tray full. I'm gonna go get another mortar tray. Just in case nobody knows what I'm talking about as far as a mortar tray, you just go to the concrete mixing station of your big box store like Lowe's or Home Depot or something like that. These are usually about five or seven dollars. I've had this one for like 10 years. Um, so it's well worth the investment to get the surface area to dry out your castings if you need it. So I'm just gonna put this over here while I'm filling it. I don't normally do a big huge harvest on blue like this because of the continuous nature of the bin. But I feel like I've been kind of slacking on my harvest of blue lately. Some of you have picked up on that. Maybe it's a little procrastination. A um, little bit of winter blues kind of making me not want to do anything. But I think we're getting close because I'm starting to see some worms now. And that is not typical at the finished end of the bin. So we're getting to an area that Maybe still has some food left in it and the worms are wanting to be in on it. Okay, so that looks like that's all I'm gonna get. So that's that's pretty good. That's, that's a good quarter of the bin that I was able to pull out. So let me get this out of the way and then we'll start 
turning the intermediate portion of blue over and get rolling here. So like I was saying, the, the difference between working on a huge bin like blue here and a smaller bin that is only this big is the surface area. And the surface area is always good because that's where the, the worms are working as a general rule in the top, you know, four, six inches of the bin. Although as I'm digging deep, it, this is like a foot deep, you're seeing worms down here. So they don't really just stay 100% in the top four inches. Um, a lot of the books that you read, they have a lot of dogma that's been passed down, but not really researched quite honestly, or proven to be true or not true. So that's why I try and show you guys what I really do here, because honestly, some of the things that they tell you in books, um, maybe that was when they were first new, or maybe they just, you know, don't like to uh, scientifically investigate things. I'm not sure, but I have found, you know, top name books that say don't feed citrus, don't feed onions, and to which I'm like, why not? And if you don't have a good answer, then I'm going to try things like a chicken bone. So it has been my experience that the worms are not harmed in any way by feeding orange and any other kind of citrus and also onions and, and peppers and things like that. I think that people just kind of, you know, I don't know, look at worms and say, well, I don't like onions or they, they burn my eyes or peppers burn my stomach or my mouth. And that's why I shouldn't give them to the peppers. They're, that's why I shouldn't give them to the worms. And, you know, doing some more of the investigation with people who are you know, professional scientist, they didn't really find, yes, there are compounds that are irritating to worms, but I think basically when they said that, they're taking droppers of those compounds and putting them directly on worms. So quite honestly, it's not the same thing. In a developed ecosystem like this that's been running for three years nonstop, I have all kinds of secondary creatures in this bin that are helping the worms to digest things. So when you say, oh, the worms don't want to eat that, well, maybe not, but I'm willing to bet the mites and the springtails and the isopods will. And then when it's broken down to a, another stage of decomposition, then the worms can get into it. I mean, yeah, I do talk about how to make things go faster, but, you know, you can only go so far. You can see there's quite a bit of worms in here because I removed so much. So they will have to start their route back this way uh, this evening once I get everything covered up. Just picking the big things out. But you can see the difference between that where you cannot see any paper and then as I'm going closer towards the feeding zone, you can start seeing things like little bits of paper, stickers from vegetables, things like that. And then I think we are going to run into a giant worm ball here. So let's, let's go a little bit more gingerly at this end because I just, and I can't remember who it was that had snails in their worm bin. I'm not really sure. I've not found a live one, but here's a, a little circle one. I don't know if they're out in my yard. I don't usually have trouble with snails. It was AV, wasn't it? He lives out on the East Coast, so I'm not sure if he has the same yard critters that I do. But yeah, I sometimes I see little snails in here. I think they're bad for plants, pretty sure, so I, if I see them, they go away in a permanent sort of way. So you can see keeping the moisture really, really good here is causing the worms to mob even though there might not be any food. The higher moisture portions are where they like to breed. So there's, there's other benefits, multiple benefits to having really, really moist uh, castings. Here's where they all sat on top underneath that um, piece of plastic I had on top. Pure castings, 100, except for that piece of plastic there. 
Ooh. So yeah, 100% castings. They go on the top of the bin and feed, reproduce, and poop. Good worms. So I'm just picking out the big things here, picking out the stickers. But it's getting a little bit warmer in the basement now. We're right at 70, so Fahrenheit. So we're really in that sweet spot. So I've got to start kicking up the feeding and also the bedding for them. That's a piece of ginger. Oh, look at that, it's starting to sprout. I'm gonna pull that out and uh, plant that. Yeah, it's weird how a piece of anything that looks really dehydrated, you put it in the worm bin and it kind of poofs it back up. So um, that piece of ginger is going to look like it was completely unusable last time when I put it in here. But uh, now it's been poofed up and it's going to start a new ginger plant for me. That will be awesome. I really enjoyed growing that last year. I didn't get a huge harvest, but hey, good enough for me. I was pleased that I was able to grow a super tropical plant. There's another one. Yeah, maybe I can plant that too. It, if it stayed in the same place long enough here in the worm bin, it would actually, you know, grow roots and everything like you see sometimes with my, my other vegetables that I put in here. But uh, because I like growing it, I'm going to rescue it and hopefully I can get some more. All right, now I'm going to move you over and we're going to look at the business end of the bin. Okay, so let's get over here. Looks like I've got some of those sweet potatoes that started degrading when I was trying to hold them over for winter. The, the sweet potatoes that I did get growing are really awesome. Let me go grab those. I know people said that sometimes they're interested in what I do as far as uh, gardening and stuff, but I just lay the, the potatoes in some uh, potting soil and then just keep them watered and you'll often get little sprouts. I've got four different kinds of sweet potatoes in there that I bought last year as slips and I just kept them over the winter and yeah, this needs watered. But uh, for the most part, they'll just make me slips 12 months out of the year once I have that particular kind. Works with grocery store too. Just get organic because otherwise the uh, sprout inhibitor will stop it. All right, back to the worms. All right, so as we're working over, ooh, looks like we might have a worm ball. Comment below, how long have you been uh, a worm farmer or whatever you want to call yourself? Have you been doing it, you know, more than 10 years? What got you? Ooh, woo, there, wait. Okay, okay, hold on. Thought, complete interruption. But we got a worm ball. And that is because there is something, oh, that's sweet potato. They're all mobbing around those little sweet potato bits. Good worms! And then big avocado pit there. Now what I have been doing when I've been sifting is I've been taking anything that's on the top and then soaking it in a bucket so that when I put it back into the worm bin it has a better chance of getting digested. There's my cork. That looks like it's part of a lime. It'll go to the end. Certain foods do take a really long time, but this sweet potato, I had a feeling, wasn't going to take. Uh, it was not going to be one of those epic foods that takes months and months and months. Wait, I think that's the tea. Yep. That is the, uh, I think it's like Revolutionary War, like the stuff they put in the, the Boston Harbor when they're, you know, trying to kick the British out. Um, does not smell like tea. Not at all. They have definitely started converting that. All right, so they're really getting into that avocado. People wonder, why do you feed food that's gonna take for so long? Well, when they run out of their other food, this isn't really even an avocado. This is the actual pit of the avocado that they are in there with. And their BFFs, the um, brown mites. Put that at the far end. So when you're seeing the different colors here, some of the darker colors is from me re-wetting old uh, overs for sifting and then putting that back in the bin. 
and I think they're farther advanced than just the regular Amazon boxes. Okay, keep going. Got some paper, that's good. I like to see that there's a little tiny bit of food left after, you know, when I come back, because that way I feel like, you know, I haven't shorted them. You know, sometimes if I come in and I don't find anything, then I think, well, I should have fed more last time. So to me, it's good to see a tiny little bit of food left. That way I know they didn't do without. I think that was one of the biggest things I had to learn when I was first worm farming was patience, which I'm not good at. Basically, when the worms are done, they're done, and that's when they need more food. You can't always uh, get what you want out of them if you push them too hard. So, still looking. They've got bedding, a little bit of food left. So, we are doing good. When you have somewhere between, you know, 12 and 20 pounds of worms in a system, sometimes it's really hard to gauge how much food to give them simply because some food is fast food and they will eat it right away. And then um, apparently this tea envelope was not edible. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm gonna leave that open so the worms can escape. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's when you have this big of a bin, it is a whole different game. You've got three different kinds of worms in here, three or four, I don't know, I might have some, whatever the native worm is here, other than red wigglers. I think somebody called it rubellus one time. Um, so I have all these different kinds of worms that are specific to certain kinds of food or good at certain kinds of food. And then you've got worms that kind of go to sleep for part of the year. So another worm ball and some more bedding. So that's that's good. They're in the roots of something here. So one of the good things about having the bins that have the mixed species, I know some, it's pretty controversial about having blue worms, but in my, in my estimation, it's good because during the summer when I have a glut of food, the, the blue worms are at their most active and that way they can take care of all of that summer food clippings and whatever fresh vegetables I'm eating in the house because they're definitely up for all of all of the kind of food and but then they kind of go to sleep in the winter time when I don't have as much fresh food available so it kind of all works out this you know works out uh, with the different kinds of breeds in the same bin kind of got a little avocado there All right, so we've made a lot of room here. So we have got space for lots of new bedding and lots of new food. So let me go get some bedding. I had a bit of a windstorm, and even though I had personally raked up my leaves for the most part, um, apparently some came in from the, the park and whatnot. So these guys are going to get a bit of a treat, a little influx of uh, fresh mold or, and whatever native critters are in my leaves to blue. He can always use all the help he can get. So that's really, really dry. So let me do something about that. So we eat a lot of eggs in our house. And lately, instead of going and turning them into a powder, sometimes we just put them in the blender, blend them up and make them liquid, oftentimes with something acidic so that it can start breaking down the eggshells, and then they can get fed. I can smell that that's a little bit of kimchi too. All right, let's get their real food. Okay, so we have a little bit of squash here, green beans and peppers, more squash. Um, believe it or not, this is some salsa, not real hot salsa. Here's some of that kimchi that had gone too far. For you kimchi eaters out there, you know what I mean, if it's gone too far. Apple, orange peels. Let's get them their prepared bedding. If you watched the uh, Red Wiggler video from last week, 
this is where one of that little worm that kept running around and getting loose, he ended up being by himself in there. So he was an only child for a couple of weeks there. Let me get some more bedding to put on top. Now this is fresh out of the shredder and, but it's not just paper and cardboard. There is um, kelp meal in there and you might even see a little bit of steam because I used warm water to try and help break it down a little bit because I knew we would have those super, super dry leaves to uh, put in there and we want to make sure that enough moisture gets to this end of the bed so that everything can get finished and eaten. We got probably 15 gallons of the finished worm castings today. We put in about three gallons of people food. They got a four gallon bucket of leaves and then a five gallon bucket of the prepared bedding with the kelp meal. And they also got quite a bit of grit in the way of all of that pureed eggshell. All right guys, well, if you like this bin, it has its own playlist and I will put that right over there. And if you've already seen that, YouTube thinks you're gonna like this video right over here. All right guys, thanks for hanging out with me and my worms and everybody have a good day.